piece here. So I don't keep you here till five o'clock tonight with my message. Okay. Well, friends, we're going to be in Daniel, the 10th chapter, if you can locate Daniel 10. And we're going to see some very, very interesting, mysterious, and controversial things. But we don't shy away from controversy. Okay. So if I could just have the first picture there. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm the problem here. He's probably already got it up there, but my... Let's see. I, I thought I'd put, give you a picture to help us here. Okay. That's kind of... Are we good? Oh, okay. The machine's smarter than me. <laughs> what else is new? Okay, guys, remember last week we were in Daniel 9. And Daniel was given a spectacular prophecy, and it involved Christ the Lord and his redemptive work. And in the prophecy, uh, Daniel was told that at 444 BC, or the time when the decree would be given to rebuild Jerusalem, there would be 483 years until Messiah the Prince would come. Now that's Jesus, and this shook out perfectly. We saw that. And then uh, there would be one more set of seven years, one more week of years, and then would be the end of the world. Jesus would return and establish his kingdom. Seventy weeks or 70 sets of seven years. And we were introduced to this mysterious uh, time block that Daniel never saw. Remember, Messiah came into the world after the 69th week, and he was killed, but he did not die in the 70th week. It was after the 69th. That was a little clue that there is a time block here between the 69th and the 70th week or the last seven years of earth history. This is called the church age. Paul tells us in Ephesians 3, none of the Old Testament prophets knew about this time block that you and I are living in right now. This is called the age of grace. The time, the stopwatch has stopped and God is calling Gentiles into his kingdom. This is the age of grace. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If we could just get that next picture, I'll show you a kind of a, a, this is a way we might understand this. You see, here's Daniel, and he looks ahead and he sees Calvary. He sees Messiah cut off, and he looks ahead and he sees uh, the end of the world. He sees resistance from the Antichrist, and he sees the Lord's ultimate victory over him, and he just sees these two mountain peaks. That's all he sees from where he's standing. But you and I, we've sort of come around over to here, and we can see, oh, there's a valley between these two mountains. And that's where the church age resides. That's where we, we are trafficking right through this time block called the church age. It is going to end with the rapture of the church, and we're going up. We will hear a trumpet. You'll hear the voice of an archangel. And you and I are going to be caught up in the clouds together with uh, new covenant saints who have gone on to be with the Lord. You're going to be caught up in the clouds with them, with their glorified bodies, and you'll have a glorified body, and we will always be with the Lord from that point on. And that will end the church age, and at that time, God will reactivate his covenant people, national ethnic Israel, for the last seven years of earth history, the seven-year time block we call the time of Jacob's trouble with Antichrist reigning and ruling over the world. And, um, but he knows his days are short. So I just thought the visuals would be helpful to you. And uh, just remember also that this spectacular prophecy came on the other side of a long, heartfelt, believing prayer. That's how it works. And we're going to see that again as we go through Daniel. Uh, look please now at Daniel 10 in your Bibles. Daniel 10, verse 1. Daniel says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. He's going to learn some more about the end of the world. Uh, notice here the two terms, understood and understanding. You remember what Jesus said? In Matthew 24, 15, he said, whoever reads Daniel, let him understand the preciousness and the blessedness of understanding. This is why the Proverbs is replete with instructions to all of us to get wisdom, get understanding. 
There's no substitute for it. This is something our world is lacking, sorrily lacking. Real wisdom, real understanding, real insight. You can see it. It's being reflected all the time in the laws and policies and bylaws and restrictions and all the rest of it that we're dealing with right now. Where is the wisdom? It's just not there anymore. And I want to say that real understanding is absolutely off the table, impossible, aside from a faith foundation. It's one of the tragedies of the modern era that we have pitted faith against reason, like they're against each other somehow. That's not true. You can't have right reason apart from a faith foundation. You remember Hebrews 11, verse 3? What does it say? It says, by faith we understand. By faith we understand. You put your ultimate faith commitment in the God of the Bible. You take as basic the things he tells you. Those things are irrevisible. They are foundational. They don't need to be backed up. God speaks on his own authority. And from that foundation, you can begin reasoning properly. If you don't have that foundation, forget it. You'll never get wisdom and insight. And I want us to remember that amazing revelation, prophetic truth with understanding will come on the other side of sincere, sustained, believing prayer. I am continually, in these last of days, being confronted with the importance of prayer, real prayer, not just mouthing a couple words, but real prayer, real interaction with a real God. This is becoming uh, more and more urgent in these last of days. Uh, Look at, please, verse 2 now. Look at Daniel's prayer. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, literally weeks of days, 21 days. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. This man is serious about prayer and fasting. Very serious. Three weeks of it. Can you imagine? Uh, do, you know, do, you, do you see how patient he is with God? That, that is something we are lacking. We, are, we live in a fast food, instant gratification culture. It's one of the tragedies of uh, affluence and luxury that we are enduring right now. We are pleasure seeking. We are pleasure driven. Uh, we are instant gratification seekers. And God says, I will answer your prayer when I'm ready. And maybe that's a lesson in itself. You're going to learn some patience. And you, I think many of you know my history. Uh, when I was a young man, uh, I was absolutely fascinated with and enamored by uh, combat, martial arts, kung fu, Chinese martial arts. That was my religion of choice. And kickboxing and fighting. And that's all I thought about. Ate and drank and slept the martial arts. Hey, I'm talking to someone I've never met before, and all I'm thinking about is, how can I take that guy down if I needed to? How could I do that? That's not sensible. That's not rational to think like that. I I don't think like that anymore. But the point is, here's the point. My, My master, whatever he said, I would do it. I wouldn't question him. If he showed up late to the to the academy, I would wait out there as long as it took for him to arrive. And whatever he said, I would do it. That's dedication. That was real dedication on my part. Now, no real eternal significance to that, right? Except I have a new master now. And that dedication is now transferred to him. So I think sports is, can be very, very helpful. It, you can learn some discipline. And when you are converted, you transfer that over now to a, a master that's really worth serving. And, but bring your patience along with you. Because he'll answer your prayers when he's ready. And we don't rush God. He's not a slot machine or a Coke machine or something. You don't say a few magic words and now he does what you say. No. He's going to teach us. Even in our waiting, we're going to learn something, right? Daniel learned something. Now look at this, please, because this gets... I mean, this is spectacular. Verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, As I was by the side of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with the gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, 
and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. This awesome visit from this strange divine celestial person came after three solid weeks of prayer and fasting. The man fasted right through the Passover. Did you catch that? He is serious about prayer. Now, who is this man? Who has confronted Daniel here? If you take a look, we get one more picture here, guys. All right. Compare what Daniel saw with what John saw described for you in the book of Revelation. This man, this heavenly man that showed up to talk to these men, in my opinion, it's the same person. Daniel is being visited here by the pre-incarnate son of God. I mean, the description is too similar. This is being given to us for a reason. There are no extraneous words in the Bible. I think that he is being confronted by Jesus pre-incarnate. Uh, look at verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Can you imagine how frightening this was? You and I, we live in a world where it kind of seems to be same old, same old. But can you imagine a visitation like this one? Uh, these men fled in terror. It sort of reminds me of what happened to Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus. He, was, he had traveling companions too, didn't he? And they were all terrified also. But in both cases, there were many witnesses, but only one recipient. The divine messenger targeted one guy and shared some things with that one guy. And those who were in proximity were just terrified. They were, they were not the recipients of the message. Okay, look at verse 8. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. There's lots we could say to that, but I, I want to point out something. No strength, face on the ground, the man is as good as dead. Wouldn't you agree? That is next door to dead. And friends, this is a hard thing to have to say, but we are really not much good to God unless we're dead to ourselves. That is a major, major theme in the Bible. It cuts across the grain of the spirit of the age. We are continually reminded of how important we are how you deserve this and you deserve that, continually bombarded. So-called uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, in my, in my opinion, the non-believing ones are absolute fools in this world. All they do is tell people what they want to hear and then they cash in on that and make tons of money. I've experienced this firsthand. They are nothing more than a repeat of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's wise men. You just keep these guys around, they tell you what you want to hear, make you feel good, and uh, they get paid handsomely for it. That is ridiculous. God says, well, I have a message that cuts right into all that. You are no good to me unless you're dead. That's why Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross. You get on that thing and you die to yourself, your own plans, purposes, desires, and so on. You make God your chief joy in this life. Delight yourself in the Lord first. Then what? Then he will give you the desires of your heart. Now that's a promise. Love God first. He will put the appropriate desires in your heart that ought to be there. And then he will give you those desires. That is a way better philosophy of life. Way better. But that's a hard teaching. You have to die to yourself. Your own secular, selfish plans, purposes, and desires all have to go on the altar. And what God will give you is way better, infinitely better. It puts everything else into the shadows by comparison. Absolutely. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Paul said that. I die daily. I'm daily getting on that cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That is a, that is a theme that goes all the way through the Bible. And here's Daniel for you. He is exemplifying this physically. He's as good as dead on the ground, face to the ground. The Bible says, you and I who have entered into that love trust relationship with Jesus, we are dead. Paul says, you died and your life is hid 
in God with Christ. You are, uh, you have a life, but it's in Christ. That's it. And would you, you wouldn't want anything else, would you? <laughs> he is very God of very God. And the blessedness of being in Christ, incomparable. Absolutely incomparable. There's only one thing needful, Jesus said. And Mary of Bethany found it. It will not be taken from her, he said. If you have found it, it won't be taken from you either, no matter who says what. And we praise God for that. No one's greater than our God. Well, John experienced this too. John the Revelator. He, in John 1.17, it says, When I saw him, when I saw Jesus glorified, I fell at his feet as though I were dead, as a dead man. Common theme. Uh, look at verse 10, Daniel 10.10. 10. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. That sounds like what happened with John also on the island of Patmos. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, uh, John fell down too like a dead man, and he felt the right hand of Jesus touch him. He says, he touched me with his right hand, and Jesus spoke to John. He said, I am the first, I am the last, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, I have the keys of Hades and of death. That is very similar to what happened to Daniel with one incredible key difference, friends. Note this one. The hand that touched Daniel did not have the covenant marks in it. The hand that touched John did. This is post-Calvary. In my opinion, I think it's very likely that John looked over and saw that hand. He saw the marks. And he was reminded, this awesome heavenly man loves me. He loves me. The marks in his body prove it. Whether or not John saw the marks, we, we can leave that up to debate. But you and I know those marks are there in his body and we will see them one day. That is a constant reminder to us that the biblical statements regarding Christ and his claims and his redemptive work are not empty claims. He really does love the world. He really did rise bodily from the dead. Look at verse 11 now. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. You know, some people think this can't be Jesus. I mean, Jesus, being, Jesus was sent. Isn't he very God of very God? Yes, but the Father sent the Son to be Savior of the world. Jesus is a sent one. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 3, 1, that Jesus is the high priest and the apostle of our confession. You know what an apostle is? An apostle is just a sent one. And Jesus was sent by the Father. John's gospel is replete with references to this. The fact that this heavenly man was sent is no argument that he is just an angel and can't be Jesus. In fact, there's a mysterious figure that shows up all the way through the Old Testament. He is called the Malak Yahweh. He is the angel of the Lord. And in a single conversation, the angel of the Lord becomes the Lord you realize there's a divine nature to this angel of the Lord. In fact, he was asked in Judges 13 to identify himself. What's your name? Asked Manoah, Samson's father. The angel of the Lord said, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? You remember Isaiah 9, 6? Speaking of Jesus, he shall be called wonderful. Mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. That is the child that was born. That's the son that was given the angel of the Lord. His name is wonderful. Look at verse 12. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Hey, friends, let's, let's have that sink into us a little bit, into our minds. Prayer matters. Something happens when you pray. This heavenly man would not have come if Daniel didn't pray. He said that, I've come because of your words, Daniel. I would, have not have, would not have been dispatched if you didn't pray. This one atheist confronted me recently. He said, why do you pray? God already knows the, what, what you need. Why bother praying if he knows? I said, you pray so you can get those things. That's the difference. 
God wants you interacting with him. This is not merely a general soldier type relationship or a king subject relationship. You got a heavenly father that's adopted you into his family and he wants a little time with you. I want time with my kids. I, and when my daughter comes to visit me, I'm happy to see her. It's good that she's coming around. And our heavenly father wants you to spend some time with him. And he says, I know what you have need of, dear child. Why don't you ask me? And I can give it to you. I mean, that's tender. That goes way beyond some kind of obedience-based discipleship. This is love-based, isn't it? Yes, of course. Now watch, this is going to get very mysterious here. Here we go. Verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, right there, people say this cannot be Jesus. Because, first of all, how can Jesus be resisted? And how can he be helped? Well, we're going to look at that for just a second here. But first of all, who, who is the prince of Persia? Who could this be? The prince of the kingdom of Persia. In my opinion, and many Bible teachers agree to this, the nations of the world are all being manipulated by fallen, unclean, demonic spirits. I think Canada's got one that's working overtime right now. And I'm serious. In Daniel 10, we have princes of Persia and Greece being mentioned. And in Job 1, you know, in Job 1, Satan demanded to sift Job. Remember that? And God told Satan, you can do what you want to him, but you can't touch the man himself. What did Job do? He actually moved the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans to go launch warfare on Job's family. He manipulated nations. Did you see that? No problem. I can manipulate nations, says Satan. In Ezekiel 28, uh, the satanic power behind Tyre is addressed. In Isaiah 14, it's the satanic power behind Babylon that's addressed. There are satanic, demonic powers manipulating nations. It's always been like that. Well, Israel has an angelic power behind them too, and his name is Michael. He's a good angel. He's the archangel. You know, unseen to all, any of us, there's a battle going on in the spiritual realm. It's happening all the time. Pray for our country, please. The demonic agenda here, obviously, was to silence the prophetic voice. Daniel was praying. The Lord's on his way to talk to him, and evil spirits are trying to prevent that from happening. It's been going on since the dawn of human history. Jesus lumped Abel in with the prophets, and Abel was killed by his wicked brother Cain in an attempt to silence the prophetic voice there at the dawn of human history. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. No wonder they are Satan's most obvious target. Silence God's word. Outlaw the Bible. Burn the Bible. Turn people's faces away from the Bible at all costs. That is Satan's strategy right now. Silence the prophetic voice. That's what he was trying to do. And so you can see it all the way through history. Look at the persecution that the saints have endured, especially the prophets of the Old Testament. Micaiah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist. And in the New Testament, it's James and Stephen and Paul, Peter, even the Lord himself. God's ultimate self-disclosure was destroyed by wicked men. But not forever. Our Lord overcame death for all of us. But you can see Satan's agenda at work, can't you? At all cost, silence that prophetic voice. But the question remains, how can the Lord be withstood he said, I was on my way to see you, Daniel, but I got held up 21 days. I was withstood. How can the Lord be withstood like that? I have some shocking news for all of us. The Lord can be resisted. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit has been resisted since the dawn of the church age. And, and prior to that, even. Stephen said in Acts 7.51 to those unbelieving religious leaders, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. Resist the Holy Spirit? Yes been happening since since man's been on the earth in mark 6 5 it says that jesus could do no mighty work in nazareth why not 
Matthew fills in the detail. Because of their unbelief, he wanted to. The Lord wanted to do works for those people, mighty works, miracles. Couldn't do it. Why? They resisted him in their unbelief. He was limited in that way. Luke says in the seventh chapter of his gospel that the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. It was God's will to help them. They rejected the will of God for themselves. Do you understand that part of being made in the image of God is being granted a measure of self-determination? You make real choices, and I do too. We're not puppets on strings. You make real choices. And there's a place deep inside you that not even God is going to start manipulating. That's you. That is the deepest part of you. He'll talk to you. He'll try to persuade you. He'll do what's necessary to convince you that he is what the Bible says he is. But if you don't want it, you won't receive it. You just won't. And God will not manipulate you like a puppet. He won't do it. How do you know? Because in Isaiah chapter 5, God typifies his covenant people Israel like a great vineyard. And he begins to remind them of all the things he did for his vineyard. And at, at a certain point in the chapter, God says, what more could I have done for my vineyard that I didn't do? And if you were reformed in your theology, you might say, well, you could have gave them irresistible grace. But God seems to say he's done everything he can do for those people. And his vineyard gave him wild grapes. God can be resisted. God can be helped. God in Christ can be helped. Did you know that? Who remembers Math, uh, Mark 11, I think it is, where Jesus, at the beginning of Passover week, he sent two of his disciples to go get him a donkey to ride in on. Remember that? You two guys go get that donkey over there. If the owner comes out and asks you what you're doing, you say to him, the Lord has need of him. The Lord has need? Didn't he open the eyes of the blind? Didn't he raise the dead? Didn't he command the wind and the waves? Couldn't he just make the rope evaporate and bring the donkey over there himself? Couldn't he just make a donkey? No, the Lord has need. And those two men helped the Lord. That's amazing to me. Does God really need our help, by the way? Does he really need our help? Not really. But does he need it? Yes. This is very mysterious, friends. I don't understand it. But... Acts 1.1 refers to all that Jesus began to do and teach. He's got some unfinished work around here. The work of redemption on the cross is finished. He said, it is finished. That's done. But the work of evangelizing, the work of telling people about Jesus, doing good in the world, overcoming evil, he has entrusted that to men and women. You know what I mean. I'm still old school. People are good at... How are people saved? By grace through faith. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, people are not going to exercise faith unless they hear the word. They're not going to get the word unless somebody tells them. No one's going to tell them if they're not sent. This is how God has chosen to govern man. And we don't say, God, what are you doing? Why don't you get angels to do the job? No, God says, I've chosen men to do this. I'm going to work with imperfection and the entire created order is going to look at the manifold wisdom of God. What magnificent things he did with broken vessels of clay. All the angels will marvel at the wisdom and power of God. We have work to do. Paul said in Colossians 1.24, I fill up in my body what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What does that mean? That means that God demands in us all a personal representation of gospel truth in how you're living, how you're speaking, and how you endure the things you're enduring. The world is watching, and God demands a personal representation in your own life. The task is overwhelming. We cannot possibly do this on our own. It just cannot happen. Maybe you feel overwhelmed. I know I do. It's daunting. And the opposition is fierce, maybe greater than it's ever been in the Western world. Well, I have some good news. Ready? Our last verses together. Daniel 10, 18. 
Daniel 10, verse 18. Just jump ahead. I mean, Daniel had nothing left. He was overwhelmed the same way you are, and me too. Verse 18. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. The God of Israel is the one who gives strength and power to his people. That is a promise from the Psalms. You know, the Old Testament is divided into three parts, isn't it? The law, the prophets, the writings. And in each of those divisions of the Old Testament, you'll find a beautiful phrase. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. It appears three times, one in each section of the Old Testament. The Lord is my strength. How much strength does God have? Limitless. How much endurance do you need? He can give it. How much patience do you need? He can give it. You need courage? He has an infinite amount. Whatever you need, he can supply it. He has called all of us to get some work done around here, even in the last of days. The hour is coming, Jesus said, where no man can work. We must work while, the, while it's still day. And God promises us, he will give you what you need to get the job done. And mystery of mysteries, when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, he'll reward you for the faithfulness. He gave the opportunity, he gave the talent, he gave the resources, he gave the strength, he gave you everything you need to do what must be done, and then he rewards you for your faithfulness. That is a great God. That is a God worth serving. That is a God worth loving. It's a God worth telling other people about, in my estimation, I think in yours too. Friends, let's close with a word of prayer here, okay? And commit these things to God. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for confronting us with your holy and precious word today. Lord, your word is a treasure beyond measure. Thank you, God, for encouraging our hearts. Thank you for every glimpse of Jesus that we see in this precious sacred library from God. Lord, seal into our hearts and minds the truths that we've heard today. We want to honor you, Lord. We want to love you. We want to be faithful to you. We know that we're weak. We know that we're broken. But Lord, we rejoice in a God that can take weak things and do stupendously mighty and significant things with them. Lord, use us individually. Use us as a church family to be light reflectors, to do good in the world and to overcome evil for your glory and for the good of those that you love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray it. Amen and amen. Praise our great God. God bless you, dear saints.